Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us today at New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well. At, at New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, we know that the cost of property taxes is a deciding factor for many people on whether they retire in New Jersey or not, and that the high property taxes can also impact older adults who are on a fixed income with the ability to you know, maintain their property um, as well as afford food, gas, and many other essential things. So as part of the New Jersey Statewide Collaborative's Local Accelerator Group, we are striving to make New Jersey an age-friendly and affordable state at multiple levels. I wanna thank the members of the Local Accelerator Group for helping to organize this presentation today. And I wanna thank both April Watson and Monisha Moore from the State Treasury for sharing their expertise. Our goal today is to help you bring this information back to your community, your friends, your neighbors, so that we can get the word out and help older residents who are eligible sign up and receive these really important benefits. So we're going to start today with the senior freeze and then we'll hold, uh, if you can hold your questions to the end. If you do have a, an immediate question or something wasn't clear, put it in the chat, but otherwise we'll hold the uh, for a Q and A session at the end. And then we're gonna go into the anchor program. Um, there have been expansions in both of these programs, which we're really excited to hear about. And before I turn it over to Abra, I just have a couple of polls so we can see um, who you are and where you're coming from. So if you can see the poll on the screen, you can check off as many of these that apply to you, whether you're here for yourself. I know there are a lot of libraries present, um, a lot of the age-friendly communities. You just check off which one applies to you. That's great. We have a lot of senior advisory, advisory committees and um, local government. Terrific. And also, um, if you haven't yet, please put your name and the organization you represent in the chat so that we have a good idea of who you are. And, you know, if we want to reach out to you later, we know where to find you. This is going to be recorded and we'll send the link to everybody who has registered for the presentation. Okay, and with this, I'm gonna stop the poll. Let's see who we have with us today. So we have a lot of people here representing themselves, local government, age-friendly communities, and social service organizations. That is great. Okay. Abra, now that we know who's here, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Abra Watson. I'm from the state of New Jersey, the Department of the Treasury, specifically with the Division of Taxation in our unit called Taxation University. And our job is to get the word out about New Jersey's property tax um, programs and any of your tax questions. We are here. We're available to answer your questions. Um, these are some of our favorite events. My colleague, Monisha Moore, will pre be presenting uh, later on, and she'll talk about the Anchor Program. But we love getting the word out about these programs because they are really, really important for a lot of people, especially our senior community. So let's jump right on in with the New Jersey Senior Freeze Program. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk, first we're going to identify what the program is. We're going to talk about the eligibility requirements, some filing requirements, the income standards, which is different from the income standards on the income tax return for New Jersey. We're going to talk about base year changes, what they are, um, why they happen, um, and what you can do um, to help that when you have base year changes. We're also going to talk about some changes for 2023 uh, that are happening that are very positive for this program. 
And last, we'll talk about how you can contact us if you have questions about the Senior Freeze Program. So first, what is the Senior Freeze Program? Well, it's a program that reimburses our senior citizens and disabled persons for increases in their property taxes. In order to qualify, uh, the homeowner or mobile homeowner has to meet all of the eligibility requirements. Once the, the applicant meets all of the eligibility requirements, they will be reimbursed for the difference in their property taxes or increases in their property taxes beyond their first year of eligibility. So we kind of put it here as an example on the slide to kind of uh, help make it clearer. So if John Doe's first year of eligibility was 2018 and his property taxes in 2018 were $5,500 and he's filing now in 2022, and his property taxes in 2022 are $5,900. When he files his application, as long as he is eligible, he will be paying his property taxes and the 2022 property taxes. So in this example, uh, he would get $400. Hi there. Could um, Luis Rodriguez, could you mute yourself? I'm not able to mute you and we're hearing background noise. I'm not you can mute, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Are we good? Okay. So here's what the front of the Senior Freeze booklet looks like. This is the 2022 booklet. This is the current application. Uh, the 2023 application will become available in February. So what are the eligibility requirements? Well, for the 2022 application, the applicant had to be age 65 or older or receiving federal social security disability benefits no later than or by um, December 31st, 2021. They had to live in New Jersey continuously for 10 years. So we're talking um, 10 years from 2021 would be the 12-31-2011. So they had to have been in New Jersey since December 31st, 2011. They had to have owned and lived in their home for three years. So that means they had to have owned and lived in their property since uh, December 31st, 2018 or prior. Their property taxes needed, need to be paid. So for homeowners, the property taxes have to be paid by June 21st, I mean, June 1st of 2023. And for mobile homeowners, it's by December 31st, 2022. Now that June 1st date there, it depends on the year. So these uh, eligibility guidelines are for people filing for the program for the very first time. So the 2022 application is the first application they're filing. So when we're doing a PTR one or the first time filing, we're looking at two years to determine eligibility, 2021 and 2022. For 2021, the property taxes have to be paid by June 1st of 2022. The property taxes for 2022 have to be paid by June 1st of 2023, okay? So you have till June 1st of the following tax year to make sure you have all of the property taxes for the prior year paid in. When it comes to mobile homeowners, they have to have their site fees paid by December 31st of the applicable year. So for someone filing a PTR1 for 2022, remember we're looking at two years, 2021 and 2022, they have to have their 2021 site fees paid by December 31st, 2021, and their 2022 site fees paid by December 31st, 2022. The income limits. The income limits for 2021 is $94,178. For 2022, the income limit goes up to 99,735. So your income has to be at those dollar amounts or less. If your income exceeds the dollar amounts that you see on the screen, then you're not eligible 
for this program. The income limits also are the same regardless of filing status. So a single individual is 94,178 for 2021. For a married couple, it's the same income limit. The income um, requirement varies year to year. So on our next slide, you'll see we have a list of what historically have been the income limits um, for this program. And as you can see, it goes up a little bit each year. There's a cost of living increase that's applied to the income limit annually. So each year, it'll go up a little bit. You'll also notice that from 2017 down, that the income limit uh, is 70,000, pretty much the same. And you'll see like uh, if someone filing a PTR1, they, it was different income amounts. So the re let me just give you a little bit of brief synopsis of why that is. Property tax relief in New Jersey is based on the money that's available in the budget. So, depending on what the budget looks like that year, there could be certain um, things or parameters that are put in the budget to limit the payout because there is not as much money in the budget as they would like. So in these years, 2017 through, tw actually, I think it goes all the way back to 2009, we allow people to apply and that we allow people to maintain a base year but if their income for that year exceeded 70,000, they didn't actually get a check. So just letting you know, because there was less money in the budget in those years, it was capped at 70,000 for people to receive a check. They might still be in the program, but they weren't actually getting a check if their income exceeded that amount. I am happy to say, that uh, under our current administration, uh, Governor, um, Governor Murphy has been really committed to paying this out to our seniors. So you'll notice starting with 2018 moving forward, the income, whatever the income limit was that was originally published for this program, that was the income limit to receive a check. And um, since 2018, our seniors who are eligible for the program have been receiving their reimbursement. So that's a really good thing. There are certain properties that are ineligible for the senior freeze program. Uh, the bottom line is the, um, the property that you are listing on your senior freeze application needs to be your principal residence. So if you own other properties that are not your principal or your primary residence, such as a vacation home, or you have rental properties, or you have other types of properties that would not be eligible, such as a property that has more than four units, it's not eligible for this program, even if you live in one of the units, or you have a property that has four units or less, but you have more than one commercial unit. Properties with more than one commercial unit are not eligible, even if you happen to live in the property. So those are our ineligible properties. There are also certain types of homeowners that are not eligible. Um, if you are a totally 100% disabled veteran and you have applied for and receive 100% exemption from paying any property taxes to your municipality, you're not eligible for this because you're not paying property taxes. Um, also, if you are someone who is paying pilot payments, pilot payments are payments in lieu of tax. If you're paying, making those type of payments to the municipality, they are not considered property taxes. Therefore, you're not eligible for this program, okay? If you have life estate or life tenancy, you are still eligible as long as you're occupying that property as your principal residence. So when we're talking life estate or life tenancy, that is a clause that is put on the deed that says that particular individual has the right to occupy that property until they pass away. At such time when they pass away, then the property um, becomes the person listed on the deed becomes the owner. So as far as we're concerned for purposes of the senior freeze program, if you have life estate or life tenancy that clauses on the deed, although it may be your children's names listed as owner, but you have that clause that says you have the right to live there, we consider you the owner and we consider you to be the eligible person to file for the property tax reimbursement or the senior freeze. Now let's talk some income standards. All income has to be 
support it when you are um, filing for the senior freeze program. So remember I said it's 94,000 or 99,000, depending on which year we're looking at. But here we're asking basically for all of the income that you receive during the year, unless it is specifically, unless we specifically state in the instructions that you don't have to report it. So what are some income sources that you would have to report on your senior freeze application that you're not necessarily reporting on a tax return? Social security benefits is a big one. New Jersey doesn't tax social security benefits, but you are required to report it when determining your income for the senior freeze program. Pension and retirement benefits are also required to be reported. Unemployment benefits, if you happen to be receiving unemployment, it's not reportable on the tax return, but it would be reportable here on this application. And again, it's just to determine if you meet the income requirement to be eligible for the program. Net profits from business would be reportable here. Income that should not be reported, that is specifically says in the instructions, we don't want you to report it. If you got a middle-class tax rebate, if you are um, participating in the Paycheck Protection Program during COVID and you had some kind of loan or something that you have forgiven, you don't have to report that. Economic impact stimulus payments, you don't have to report that. Income tax refunds, you don't have to report that. That's not considered income for purposes of reporting your income for the senior freeze. There are some other type of um, payments that someone might receive. It is all outlined in the instructions. It tells you exactly what income you should include and what income you don't have to include. What I will tell you is that when it comes to the senior freeze, a lot of it has to be included in comparison to the tax return where not as much needs to be included on the tax return. So now let's talk some filing requirements. The filing deadline is October 31st, um, 2023. So you still have time. If you realize from this presentation today that actually you're eligible and you should be filing, you have time to do that. Um, the checks, we started mailing them July the 15th, and you'll see that we mail them at staggered dates depending on when the applicant files. So someone who files between now and October 31st should expect to receive their reimbursement by December 1st of 2023. Now that timeline could increase if there's information that we need, something that we need to verify from you. We ask you to mail something in, something like that, that could increase the uh, processing time. But what I will tell you is that we've been really committed to getting the um, payments for this program out um, according to the timeline that you see here on the screen. Proof of age. That is one thing. So if you're saying that you're, you're applying because you're age 65 or older, you have to submit proof that you actually meet the age requirement. So we're looking for you to provide a birth certificate or your driver's license. Um, we also accept church records like your baptismal record. Um, that would be proof of age um, for us. We would, that would be acceptable. If you are claiming that you're not 65 or older and instead you are applying because you um, are receiving federal social security disability benefits, then what we need is a copy of the social security award letter that states you are receiving those benefits as of the eligibility date. Now remember, we're talking 2022. If you're filing for the first time where you would need to be receiving federal social security disability um, benefits, no later than December 31st of 2021. It doesn't count if you're receiving the benefits on behalf of someone else. So if you have a disabled child or something like that and you're getting disability benefits for that disabled child, that does not make you disabled for purposes of applying for this program. So that's an important side note there. Another thing that you'll need to enclose with your application is proof of payment when it comes to the property taxes. So if you're a homeowner, we're gonna require you to submit copies of your property tax bills so we know how much property taxes you were assessed by the township and proof that you actually paid them. So that would be copies of your canceled checks or receipts if you just take payment to the township and they stamp it and um, that's, that's fine, as long as we can clearly see the stamp that payment was received. 
if you're paying um, your taxes through um, a mortgage company, then copies of your form 1098 for both years showing that the property taxes were paid would be acceptable. Now, sometimes it's hard for people to put their hands right on all of that documentation. And especially if we're talking checks, it can be a lot trying to get copies of canceled checks and things like that. So we have in the booklet, what we call the um, proof of payment verification form. So you can, that's called our PTR1A. So it, you take the PTR1A down to your local tax collector. They fill in their section, you fill in the top, they fill in their section, and then they certify it. They have a stamp that came from the Division of Taxation that they stamp it. That lets us know that it has been verified by your municipality that those property taxes have been paid. If you live in a co-op or a continuing care community, you can do, we have a special PTR1A for you. Um, you can get that form online. You take that to your management office, they can fill that in, or you simply provide a statement from the management company and that would be sufficient to prove that property taxes were paid for your home. Whatever, whichever way you decide to go, whether you go with the canceled checks and copies of the bills, or you have the PTR1A filled in, make sure you enclose it with the application. If you don't enclose it with the application, then you'll get a lovely letter from us saying, hey, we need proof that you actually paid your property taxes before we can approve your reimbursement. That will take longer for you to get your check. Remember I was talking about those timelines and I said, if we have to get more documentation from you, that extends the processing time. So here is a copy of what that form PTR1A looks like. So you'll see at the top, that's to be completed by you. You tell us your name, your social security number, where you live, the block and lot number for your property. You let us know if you own the property with someone who wasn't your spouse. If your property has multiple units, you tell us all of that up at the top. Part two is filled in by the tax collector. They tell us how much the assessed value of their property, what the rate is in your particular town, for, and then the property taxes that they assessed based on the rate and the assessed value. Um, if there's something that you've done special to the property, like an added assessment or something like that, or you appealed with the township, the property, the tax collector will let us know. Those uh, type of adjustments do matter. So if they let us know that, then there might be some adjustment that we need to do. And I'll explain that a little bit more um, for a little further in the presentation. If you're a mobile home owner, we also require proof of payment of your site fees. So acceptable documentation would be a copy of your contract or the agreement that you have with the mobile home park um, that shows what your site fees would be and then proof that the site fees were paid. So that would be copies of canceled checks or receipts for both years, or a signed statement from the mobile home park management saying that they received the site fees from you for each of the, of the application years. Or they can simply submit, you can simply take them the PTR 1B form, which are for mobile home owners, take that to the mobile home park management, they're going to certify part two saying, yep, we received the payments that we needed to receive. And you attach that or submit that with your PTR1 as proof that the site fees were paid for your mobile home. Here's what that form looks like. The part one is completed by you, the applicant. Part two is where the mobile home park management fills it in, letting us know what the site fees are, were, and that they were paid, certifying that it was paid. Now, deceased residents, if you have a resident who has died, but they met all of the eligibility requirements, they were alive and in the property on December 31st of each of the years, then you can file on their behalf. The important thing is with the name and address, make sure that you print deceased and the date of um, the date of death for the decedent at the top of the form. And then you're going to sign the application in your capacity. 
So if you're the surviving spouse, you're going to sign as such. If you are the executor or personal representative, you will sign as, as such. The instructions in the PTR 1 or the PTR 2, depending on what, which application you are filing, um, really outlines how to fill it in when you are filing on behalf of someone who is deceased. So first time filers, you're going to file the PTR 1. The PTR 1 for 2022 is establishing your base year at the 2021 level. So you're filing the 2022 application, but since it's the first time, you're going to be required to report information for two years so that we can determine that, yes, 2021 should be your base year. What that means is that we are reimbursing you for any increases in your property taxes beyond the 2021, um, 2021 tax year. So for 2022, you're going to get the difference between the amount you paid in 2021 and the amount you paid in 2022. 2023 rolls around. You're going to file a PTR2 for 2023. And now you're going to get the difference between 2021 and 2023. So as you can see, the longer you're in the program, the more beneficial this program becomes for you. I can tell you that I uh, started working for the Division of Taxation 24 and a half years ago when we first started with this program. Year one, I was involved with this program. And so someone who is in the program in 1998, if they're still alive and still applying for this program, their checks are pretty big by this time because now we're talking many years later, they're still in the program and now they're getting reimbursed for any property tax increases above the, the uh, 1998 year. So you can imagine they're receiving a nice benefit at this point. So if you are year two, then you should be filing a PTR2, meaning you already established your base year, you filed in a previous year, whatever year that might be, you should get a PTR2 in the mail. When you get the PTR2, it comes pre-printed with your base year. And all you need to do is verify that you continue to meet the eligibility requirements for the 2022 tax year. If you do, great. We will reimburse you the difference between 2022 and whatever that base year amount is that's already pre-printed on your form. Well, what if you don't get the correct form? Suppose you've been filing for this all along and all of a sudden you get a PTR-1 in the mail. Well, what does that mean? Why did I get a PTR-1 when I've been in the program and I really should have received a PTR-2? Well, the way our system works is if you file an application with us and we need more information from you and we don't get it, we sent you a letter, we didn't receive anything, then the system never approves that reimbursement for that year. If, if the system never issues you a reimbursement for that year, then the next year, instead of mailing you a PTR2, we mail you a PTR1 because we assume that for whatever reason, you weren't eligible that year. So if you weren't eligible, then we're mailing you a one to say, okay, you've got to start all over again. Now that might not be the case. It may be something very simple that we can handle for you right over the phone. So if this happens to you or it happens to your client or someone you know, give us a call, that phone number right there on the screen, 1-800-882-6597 to find out what's going on. It may be something simple where we just need to get some information from you and once we get it, we can approve the, the prior year so that, so that it doesn't cause problems on future applications. All right, so the income standards, we talked a little bit about that, but I'll talk about it again. The instructions are pretty clear when it comes to um, where you look on your documents to determine the income amount. So for instance, when it comes to social security and railroad retirement benefits, we tell you, look at box five, go to your, your SSA 1099 statement, box five is the number we're looking for. When it comes to pension income, we want the pension income that you reported on your New Jersey um, tax return. So on the NJ 1040 line 20A, which is the taxable portion of your pension or retirement income, 
That's the number we're looking for. If you don't have to file a tax return, you're not required in New Jersey because you're under the filing threshold, no problem. You can either go back and try to figure it out as if you file the return, that's what that Appendix A is, is go ahead and figure it out um, the same way that you would have had you filed a return. I'm going to suggest that you not do that at all. <laughs> if your income is not is nowhere close to that ninety-four dollars or $99,000 threshold, I wouldn't even bother trying to do these fancy calculations. I would just put down there whatever it is that you received because the income threshold is not an issue for you. So I wouldn't try to do all these calculations. It's just, it's not necessary if you're not close to the income requirement. If you're close to that income threshold, then I would take the time to do the calculation. Line C, the salaries, wages, commissions, bonuses from your W-2, we're looking for box one of the W-2. Now, normally when you're filing a New Jersey tax return, we always say drop down to, down to the further boxes, boxes 15 through 17, so that you get all the state information. For this program, we're not looking for state, we're looking for the information um, that you would be reporting like on a PAD, a, a PAAD application. So what we're looking for is box one of the W-2, which is your federal wage amount. All right, I've been doing a lot of talking. <laughs> All right, so income adjustments. There are certain adjustments that you might have to make. Again, it's not exactly the same as what you report on your New Jersey income tax return. So there are certain types of income, while exempt on the New Jersey income tax return, is required to be reported for the senior freeze program. For instance, military pension. Military pension in New Jersey is not taxable. It's not taxable, but it is reportable for determining your eligibility for determining your eligibility for senior freeze. So you'll need to report it if you're receiving a military pension. Um, if you're receiving pension for total and permanent disability, it's not taxable, but it is reportable for determining your eligibility for senior freeze. When it comes to the Roth IRA, um, you're going to report it. It says any distribution from a Roth IRA that you would have reported had it been a traditional IRA, you're required to report it for this program. So um, follow the instructions on that. Make sure you're reporting it correctly. Base year changes. Sometimes your base year changes and there are reasons for that. And we have some of them on the slide. The reason your base year could change could be because your income exceeded the original limit. So now you have to establish a new base year on a future application. That does unfortunately happen to people. Your property taxes go below the base year amount. So now you have to reestablish at a lower amount. That also happens. You, you go to the municipality and you say, no, you're, the property taxes are too high for my home. I need you to review this. They review it and say, yep, we agree with you. And they reduce your property taxes. And if it reduces it below your already established base year amount, then you'll need to reestablish a new base year using the new lower amount. If you move, say you move to a new home, so many people downsize. The children are grown. Everybody's moved. I, you know what? You don't need that big house anymore. So you downsize. That happens a lot. Well, if you move and go to a new property, you now have to live in that new home for two full tax years so that you can apply for a reimbursement using the base year based on the new home. Added assessment changes. Added assessments mean you have changed the property. If you have changed the property, that means that the property is not the same as when you originally applied for the, prop the property tax reimbursement or the senior freeze program. So we need to take into account that the property is now different, which means that we would have to change your base year. All right, so what if you move, you decide you wanna downsize? Remember I said you have to establish a brand new base year because you no longer live in the same home. The good news is we have special provisions uh, in place. If you remember when I was going over the eligibility requirements, one of the eligibility requirements is that you had to live in your home for three full tax years before you're eligible. 
Well, for those that have already been in the program and have just moved somewhere else within the state, we allow you back into the program after two full years. So basically, once you've lived there two years and you know what the property taxes uh, are for two full years, now we have something to work with as far as calculating your reimbursement, and then we allow you to go ahead and apply again. That is a special application. It's called a PTR1C. Again, we try to identify people that are already enrolled in the program. We know that you've relocated. Once, we, If we can identify you, we will send you that PTR1C automatically. Uh, if you don't receive it, you, you realize that you probably should have and you haven't received it, contact us so that we can get you the right form so that we can get you back in the program as soon as possible. So let's talk a little bit about reevaluations and added assessments. First, the difference. Reevaluations are when the municipality appraises all of the property in the taxing district to ensure that they are fully and fairly uh, valuing their properties and, and assessing taxes fully and fairly for the homeowners and their municipality. So that's done township wide. Municipality, and this happened to me not that long ago, the town I live in, they reassess everybody's properties and our property taxes went up as a result. If that happens, there's really no effect on your eligibility for the senior freeze program. As a matter of fact, if you're already in the program, fantastic. You're already in it. So if the township comes and does that to you and your property taxes go up $2,000, well, you already had an established base year. So you're going to get all of that money back because you are already in the program. Um, I can tell you I was doing some, uh, Jersey City did a huge reevaluation at one point, and I remember going out to speak to them about this program. The people were up in arms as they had every right to be, um, and those that were already in the program, they had nothing to worry about. Yeah, they would have to come up with the money to pay the property taxes, but we would reimburse them for those increases so they would get that money back. So a lot of people uh, left that seminar feeling uh, some relief, knowing that they were already in the program. For those that weren't already in the program, we helped them get, get themselves uh, to get their applications filed so that they could get in the program and get the help they needed with those property taxes. Now, added assessment is a little different. Again, an added assessment means you have changed the property. For instance, you added an addition. You did something that has increased the value of the property, which resulted in an increased property tax amount. When it's an added assessment, because the property has changed, then we have to adjust the base year so that the base year reflects what the taxes would have been had that property looked like that back in the base year. So that's something we handle on our end. When they go in, and I think if you remember when I was showing you the PTR1A, I said, oh, there's a slot there where the tax collector can fill in that there was an added adjustment, uh, added assessment. When they fill that in and they say, yep, there's an added assessment, that triggers us in the Division of Taxation to take a look at it and make whatever adjustment we need to on the base year based on the fact that the property has changed. Appealed assessments. When it comes to appealed assessments, the result of an appealed assessment, and remember I said, that's when you feel like, hey, I'm paying more than what I, more than my fair share. And you go to the township and you say, I'm appealing this. I want to be reevaluated. If that happens and they decrease the property taxes, they agree with you, you may need to notify us if we've already sent you a reimbursement based on your original numbers. And now things have changed. You need to let us know. If that's the case, then you may, and we've already paid you, you may have to send some money back or they reevaluate you and they say, you know what? We weren't charging you enough. <laughs> and they increased it even more. You already filed your application. You can let us know, amend your application. Let us know that you had to end up paying even more so that we can reimburse you. All right. So what if you realize after this presentation today that you were actually eligible for this program five years ago and you didn't know anything about it? You should have been apl applying five years ago. No problem. You can still go back and apply. Now, you may say, 
well, does that mean I'm getting all those checks? No, nope, doesn't mean that at all. As a matter of fact, we're not going to send you the checks for the years that are, were already outdated. We're not going to send you the checks. But what we will do is give you the base year that you're really entitled to, which can be significant. So if you forgot to file, you missed a year, you didn't know about the program, now you know. Go ahead and file PTR1s for the missing years for which you are eligible. Include your supporting documentation for each year. I highly recommend that you mail each year separately to make sure that they're all processed. Um, and what we do is we go in and we backdate your base year. So instead of filing a PTR1 for 2022 that gives you a 2021 base year, if it turns out 2017 really should have been your base year, we will change it. We will make 2017 your base year as long as you file PTR1s for each year um, up until the, the year that you're filing the 2022 year. We'll go back in and we'll reevaluate it. Now, what I will tell you is that we this doesn't happen automatically. Even if you file the applications, what you're going to get are some letters in the mail from us that says, hey, wait, well, thanks for filing, but you're too late. That's what you're going to receive. But just give us a call and say, hey, I filed those applications late. I know I'm not going to get that money, but I want you to go back and backdate my base here because I was actually eligible prior, and then we will do that. But you will have to request it. It does not happen automatically. Okay. So if you discover you were eligible in prior years, go ahead and file those PTR1s for those years, submit your supporting documentation. I recommend that you give it at least six to eight weeks for those documents to process in our system. Call us then, say, hey, I filed some back um, applications. I would like my, ba my base year backdated and we can do that for you. You will have to call about it. It is not something that happens automatically. All right, so I have some good news. Yay, who's ready for some good news? There have been changes to this program uh, for the 2023 year. So I wanna make sure that we understand this. So for the 2023 application that will be available in February of 2024, we have some changes. These changes were as a result of uh, the law, the PL 2023 chapter 75 that Governor Murphy signed into law on June 30th as part of our budget. And what it did is it expanded and it enhanced the senior freeze program. It's enhanced it to increase the income limit to $150,000 for the 2023 filing year. This will allow a lot more people to be eligible for this program now and keep a lot of our seniors hopefully in our state. So if your income is $150,000 or less, you will be eligible. Whereas remember the income limit I gave before was 99,000 for 2022. For the 2023 application, the income limit will be 150,000 with the cost of living increases applied each year. So that income limit will continue to go up with the cost of living increase. All right. We also, this is another huge thing that will make a lot more people eligible. We've eliminated the 10-year New Jersey residency requirement. You now just need to reside, live in your home, own and live in your home for three years, and you're eligible instead of living in New Jersey for 10 years and owning your current home for three years. We've just eliminated one of those. So I can tell you that one of the um, employees that worked here, she reached out to me and she's like, you know, my, my grandmother um, moved to Virginia to take care of a sick family member. So she left like three years ago. That family member died. She came back and she bought a home here. And she's like, well, when will my grandmother be eligible? And I said to her, well, she's got to live here 10 years. She's like, what? 10 years she's got to live here? So I'm happy to say that I shared, uh, I'm going to share this good news with that employee to let her know that her grandmother is going to be eligible a lot sooner now. And she doesn't have to wait around for 10 years to meet the um, residency requirements. So I think that that is a huge change that's going to be beneficial to a lot of people. 
All right, so some resources for you. Who do you call? <laughs> so if you have questions about this program, we have our main customer service center. Uh, they're open 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, except state holidays, and that's 609-292-6400. We also have a senior freeze information line. Their hours are a little longer. So you can reach them 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Friday, and that's a toll-free number. We also have uh, the Anchor number, and my colleague Mo will come on and talk about Anchor in a few minutes. Um, so she'll give you all the lowdown on the Anchor program, which is another great program that New Jersey is offering to provide property tax relief to our residents. So that is it when it comes to the senior freeze portion. Do we have some questions about senior freeze? Hi, thank you so much. That was great, Abra. Um, I did see that people were, the questions were being answered as we went through the chat, awesome. but uh, there was one that I think we need to clarify on snowbirds and how much time, how you decide this is your, your primary residence, and does it matter how much time you spend in New Jersey versus somewhere else? You could explain that a little bit. All right. Yeah, that's a really good question. So our snowbirds, it's really about where, what's really your principal residence? What do you consider to be your home? So what we determine for that is um, where your driver's license is, where you registered to vote. Those are things that really to us tell us or signal to us what you consider to be your principal or your primary residence. If your driver's license is New Jersey, regardless, if you're spending eight months in Florida, we don't really care. If you have a New Jersey driver's license, you're maintaining a New Jersey home and you are considering that to be your principal residence, you vote in New Jersey, we consider you a New Jersey residence, even if you are temporarily somewhere else for a majority of the year. So I hope that answers the question. Um, once one starts uh, applying for property tax relief in Florida or something like that, or you switch your driver's license to Florida, you vote in Florida, you're now a Florida resident. And even if you own property in New Jersey, you're no longer eligible for property tax relief on that, on that home. Okay. Um, I have a question. And I was looking at the... Uh, outline and I went online to fill in the application and it stated that I needed to have lived in my property before 2018, December 2018. So it would no longer allow me to complete the application. Is that still the case? I purchased my property in June of 2019. That is still the case. Yes, you had to have lived in the property three years um, from, from the date of the first year on the application. So if you are doing a 2022 application, we're looking at 2021 because it's taken two years. So it's three years from 2021, which would make it 2018. So next year I will be able to apply? Mm -hmm. Yes. In 2024. Yep. Thank so you. For the 2023 application is going to look at 2022 and 2023. And three years from 2022 is 2019. Thank you. You're welcome. Abra, we also had um, several questions on condos. Could you just go over the condo ownership and if that qualifies and how it qualifies again? Very good. So when it comes to condos, condos are considered the same as, uh, as a single family home, townhome. It's all the same. So when it comes to condos, it's as long as you own your con your condominium and you're paying property taxes on your unit, you are eligible. However, when we're talking continuing care retirement communities, they're a little different. And cooperative housing complexes where you own shares in a cooperative housing corporation, they're different. You're still eligible, but the um, how you verify that the property taxes were paid you fill in a slightly different form, but you're still eligible. And that is because when you live in a cooperative housing unit or you live in a continuing care retirement community, the property tax bill does not come directly to you. It goes to the management of that facility for all of the units. 
So in order to figure out how much your particular unit, how much uh, property taxes you're paying for your unit, that information really needs to come from the management. So that's why you have a different type of form that you fill in to verify that property taxes were paid on your unit. Um, and there's a question too, with a 2023 PTR1B mailed out automatically, we have to call for the booklet. How do people get the booklet? Thank you. Man, you guys have great questions. I have to say. So we try to identify people by the data that we have online that we're getting from people's tax returns, the property records that we get from the township. So we try to identify people that may be eligible. If we have identified that we that you might be eligible, you'll get a PTR one in the mail. But of course, we miss some people. Some people are low income, they're not filing, so they're not really on our radar and we may not know. So if that's the case, we ask that people call in. Once we, you call in and we ask you the questions and we determine you're eligible, then we send you an application. Also, you can always go online and get a PTR-1. The PTR-1 we make available online. You can just print it out from the website. So you can go online yourself if you don't want to wait on hold for, for, to speak to somebody. Go online on our website, look, read the um, qualifications. If you know that you're eligible, print out the application and file it right there. Okay, hey, I'm looking um, at- I have um, a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I sent it in in the chat, but I'll repeat it. So I think you may have covered it, but I'm not sure. I've lived in New Jersey for most of my life and I own a home and pay taxes until September of 2016. I left New Jersey and I was gone for five and a half years. I came back uh, January of last year, but I bought my current home in November of last year. So does that disqualify me from qualifying for this program? It does because you haven't, yes. owned, you haven't owned the property long enough. Remember I said oh, you have it for three years. Okay, so, 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 so it doesn't matter the fact that I own and pay taxes up until I left in 2016, but it's the current home that you're filing it on. That's, that's correct. The part that I, yes, ma'am. Okay, that's so that means I have to be here and paying taxes for three years before I would even qualify. That is correct, but here's the good news. You don't have to now wait the 10 years to have 10 consistent years of residency in New Jersey. They were, the requirement was 10 years combined. There couldn't be a break in there. So, you know, and now that we've changed the law, you actually can qualify in three years versus waiting 10 years to live here and then and three years to own the property as well. Oh my God, hopefully you turn to still be alive. <laughs> No, right? That's what people tell me all the time. I, I know. Yeah. So looking at um, the time, I want to um, move forward onto the anchor program section. But um, Abra, could you put in the chat, if people wanted to reach out and have a presentation at their library or their senior center or in their town hall, can you please put that information in the chat for people to, um, to copy? Absolutely. And, and now we are turning this over to Monisha Moore. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Abra, thank you. I was trying my best to answer the questions in the chat, but I don't type as fast as I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a you fan. did really well. <laughs> thank well, you. Thank you. Then what I will do, I'm I'm even slower, Mel, with, with typing, but I'll do my best, okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Aver, please chime in because, you know, sometimes um, I lose my words, my train of thought. Um, so I, I did notice in the chat that someone asked if um, the senior freeze is different than Anchor, and it is. But there may be people who are eligible for both. So just keep that in mind. So what Abra was talking about is for eligible homeowners and mobile homeowners, right? And what I'm going to talk about is for homeowners and renters. So if you have a renter, they may be able to take advantage of this program. Give me one second. 
I wanted to tell you what Anchor stood for. I'm moving too fast. The Affordable New Jersey Communities for Homeowners and Renters Program. So that's how um, the governor and his, um, his staff came up with Anchor. And this is what we're going to talk about. Of course, the new information, um, types and dates of mailing notifications. Some of you may have probably already received these. Either you received the information mailer or the anchor benefit confirmation letter. And we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to also talk about who is required to file an application by mail. So that's a paper application. Um, we're going to sum it up with some key points for both homeowners and renters. Then we're going to get down to what we've all been waiting for, right? The anchor benefit payments. And then we do have another contact us page that is dealing specifically with anchor. So Abra gave you the number at the end for the senior freeze because that's a different hotline than anchor. So let's look at this. Paper, I'm just trying to move you because I see the box. Okay. So this is new information um, as it relates to Anchor. For the fall, which is coming soon, I hate to see um, summer go, but there has been an increase in benefits for seniors by $250 and the anchor benefit now we have confirmation letters and they're just for certain eligible residents and of course we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation and that's all due from this public law that we have here that was signed um, into law if you will on june 30th of this year let's look at the types and dates of mailing notifications so most homeowners and renters will receive one of the following. So there are some homeowners and renters who will receive the anchor mailers. And on there is the information how to file. Or they'll receive this new benefit confirmation letter that we just um, rolled out this year. So let's look at what all of this entails. So for the anchor information mailers, the homeowner or renter must file the application to receive the benefit. So this is an automatic. Um, I know there are a lot of questions when we do our um, property tax, um, what the division offers as property taxes. A lot of people think it's automatic, but they both have to be filed every year and within the um, frame before the deadline. Mailers are sent to homeowners and renters, and this includes new applicants and some 2019 applicants who haven't received the benefit yet for whatever reason. So there are some applicants who filed for 2019 and their um, application may be needed further review and we're just waiting on some information from the applicant. So even still, if they haven't received their 2019 benefit yet, we're going to still send them out the mailer. The homeowner mailer is green and it includes the anchor ID and pin. Keep in mind, the anchor ID and pin is exclusive to homeowners. Renters do not receive an ID and pin number. Their mailer, however, is purple. They can um, just go on the website and file because they don't have an ID and PIN number. It's um, rather pretty simple, if you will, for um, renters. We started mailing out these information mailers um, the week of August the 22nd through August the 28th. If you look, we mailed out approximately 2.1 million anchor information mailers. So we've been pretty busy. This is what it looks like. So if you look on the size, you see that there's that perforation. And I think we're all familiar with that, right? You just tear it on the side and you open it up. And then inside is the information. 
So this is basically telling them if you're eligible for the 2020 Affordable New Jersey Communities for Homeowners and Renters Benefit, whew, then this is the information that you would need to file. I want to draw your attention to the um, rectangle, if you will, there. For homeowners, you'll see that it says property location. So that will be filled in with the property location. Also, the identification number, the ID number will be there, and the PIN number will be there. Of course, it's not here because we don't want to share any personal information from anyone's account. We also have a QR code. If you know how to um, use the QR code, all you do, if you're familiar with taking pictures, all you do is open up your camera on your iPad or your cell phone, and you don't actually take a picture of it. If you just slightly hover over it, um, an e, um, a website will show up, and then you just click it, and it takes you straight to how to apply. At the bottom of that rectangle there is the confirmation number. It is very important that when you go online and you file the application that you click confirm to get your confirmation number. The confirmation is proof that you actually filed the application. So you see it says do not mail. We want you to keep this page for your records in case you have to call um, to get any additional help or inquire about your benefit. I want to draw your attention also to what we highlighted in red. So last year, 2019 anchor, we were asking for New Jersey gross income from 2019. And we saw that there was an influx of requests asking for the 2019 gross income. So we work with a young lady who was tasked with looking at all of those forms and sending them back out, trying to give people their income for 2019. Well, for this year, 2020 anchor, we're saying what we want, if you have it, is either your 2020 New Jersey gross income or your 2022 New Jersey gross income, which you can get off of your state return. It is not on your federal return. It's your New Jersey gross income and it's on line 29. And the reason around it is that we've recently just filed that. Hopefully people will have that in hand and it won't um, slow up the process. And of course, we have down there um, where you can get assistance, and we'll share more of that information a little later in the presentation. So now you see that this one is purple, and this is the mailer for renters. Once again, you just peel off the um, sides there. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't say that the deadline for this is December 29th. That's the last Friday of the year. Um, we often, well, we never have deadlines that are um, on holidays or weekends. So this is the reason why this deadline is December the 29th. So once they open this, they have the information much like the homeowners. But if you look in the box there, how to apply, you don't see the ID and PIN number and you don't see the property location. And that's because they don't need that information to file. They do, however, need to hit confirm and get a confirmation, a, a confirmation number as well. That's the proof that they actually filed the application. They had the QR code, just like the homeowner's application did. And of course, we're looking for the same New Jersey gross income from line 29. Uh, they can use their 2020 or their 2022. Let's take a look at the benefit confirmation letters. So what we just looked at was the mailers. Now we're going to look at these new confirmation letters. So homeowners and renters will receive an anchor benefit confirmation letter if they 
filed and received the anchor benefit earlier this year and met the eligibility requirements based on the 2020 tax year. So our system will look and see who filed um, and received the benefit earlier this year or who met the requirements. And then we will issue them this benefit confirmation letter. Taxation will file on behalf of these applicants unless they need to make changes. So some changes could be maybe for 2019, they had one banking account, then they switched it. So they don't want us sending it to the old bank account. So if they need to update that information, they're going to have to file an application to let us know that information has changed. Um, they can file if their name changes or something like that. But if there are no changes, then they don't have to file an application. Taxation will file on their behalf. So they don't have to do anything if nothing has changed. We started sending these benefit letters out the week of August the 14th, all the way up until the 17th. And we mailed out 1.3 million anchor benefit confirmation letters. This is what the confirmation letter looks like. It actually says on their anchor benefit confirmation letter. Um, if you look at that black spot we had there, if you will, there's a QR code there and it's specific to the taxpayer. So that's why we kind of um, took that out. But if you receive it, you should have a QR code there and it means something. Um, it's just helping us internally, but we wanted to black that out for confidentiality purposes. This is a part of what the letter states. So we have people who either received it by direct deposit or by check, but this is showing that there was a direct deposit. And it's saying, because you filed last year and you gave us this banking information, what we're going to do, if nothing has changed for 2020, we're going to issue your benefit to the same bank account. So that means that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to file the application. The division will file on their behalf and issue it to the bank account. It does tell them that if you need to change information, um, or prefer to request their paper check, then you'll have to file your own application by September the 30th. So if any changes need to be made, they need to be made by September the 30th. This is the letter. If someone re received it, their benefit in 2019 as a paper check. So it's saying, if nothing has changed, if your mailing address hasn't changed, you don't have to do anything. We're going to file on your behalf. We're going to send the check to the address on file for your 2019 benefits. All benefits will be distributed um, around November the 1st. But it tells them the same. If you need to make changes or you want to request direct deposit this year, then you'll have to file your own application by September the 30th. So let's look at this. So we talked about this. If no changes are needed, no action required. These applications will begin to process um, around October the 1st. So we're coming up to that soon. Um, changes to banking information or mailing address, the applicant must file online. They have an option to telefile or by mail. This is very important. If anyone needs to make changes, all changes should be made by September the 30th. Now we know there are some changes to names. Um, some people have passed away the applicant must file an application by mail. So we know not the person that passed away, but someone who's um, 
filing on their behalf. And that's because they're going to have to submit some kind of documentation. So if someone has died and they're filing on their behalf, because keep in mind, this is for 2020 and we're in the year of 2023. So they would send us a copy of the death certificate. Um, if someone's name changed for whatever reason, if they got married, they could um, file a paper application, send us a copy of the marriage certificate. Filing application may delay the benefit because there is um, a different processing processing process, if you will, um, for paper applications. When you do it electronically, it's a little bit faster. So we talked about this, right? The deadline to make changes, changes must be made on or before September the 30th. That's very important. If they are not changed by September the 30 and taxation hasn't already approved the benefit in our system, we are, I'm sorry, taxation hasn't approved the benefit, we are limited to the type of changes that can be made. If taxation has already approved the benefit, then unfortunately it's too late to make changes. So let's think about this. If someone didn't change, if they wanted to change their banking account information, but they don't do it by September the 30th, what do, so it's like, um, let us know before we already start the process. Because once we start the process of sending it direct deposit, there's no way for us to pull it back. So it's very important when you're talking to your clients or your constituents to let them know that if they need to make changes, um, September the 30th is coming very quickly. So they want to get those applications in along with the changes and also with the proof, the reason why they're changing something. Let's look at who's required to file an application by mail. So only certain homeowners. So for first time filers, properties owned by multiple homeowners or multiple units. So properties with multiple units can have no more than four units and no more than a commercial unit. If they do, they aren't eligible. The homeowner letter, homeowner letter or mailer with the incorrect name or a name requiring a change. So that's who can file by paper, right? Because they're going to submit um, some documents stating if there was a change in ownership. So we need to see the deed of change in ownership. If it's a marriage, of course, we need to see the marriage certificate. Death, we need to see the death certificate. So when they file by mail, um, they'll be able to show us the proof. There is also life estate and life tendency. That's who can um, file by mail. And then we have executors filing for an eligible deceased homeowner. So here is the front of the application, Anchor H. So Anchor H is for homeowners and it sums it up right here, what we just had on the previous slide. Use this form if you share ownership, if your main home was a multiple unit property, um, if you're filing for a property held in a trust, or you're considered a homeowner for purposes for the anchor benefit, but you were not the actual owner of record. So it tells you right there the reason why someone would need to file a paper application. Let's look at some key points for both homeowners and renters. So we have the bank, the, the anchor benefit confirmation letter recipient. So we talked about that. No changes needed, no action required. We're going to file on your behalf. Any changes needed, the changes must be made by September the 30th. So they had the option to go online. Um, that is anchor.nj.gov. They can do by phone or by paper. Then we have the information mailer recipients. They can go online as well by phone and file by paper. 
For some reason, if someone doesn't get an ID or PIN number, they can request it. They can go on anger.nj.gov, go on the homeowner information tab. When you see it, it will be a plus there at the beginning of need an ID and PIN. And if you click on it, it goes to the minus sign and then this drop down information will come. If you filed a 2019 anchor application last year for the same property you owned and occupied on October the 1st, 2020, access the online ID and PIN application. So we have it there online for them. But for some reason, if they did not file the anchor application last year, or they can't retrieve it by the online system, they can still request their ID and PIN by calling the anchor hotline or visiting one of our regional information centers. Keep in mind, renters do not have an ID and PIN. They can go online and file at any time before the deadline, of course. Let's look at the key points for renters. They, If they don't have any changes, it's the same. No action is required. We will file on their behalf. The same as homeowners. If there are any changes that need to be made, they need to do it by September the 30th. They, um, If they, the inform information mailer recipients, they can go online at anchor.nj.gov. And renters are not required to file an application by mail. We do know that some people may want to. That's fine. The paper applications are available online. So if you have a client or um, a constituent who's saying that they want to file online, just let them know. I'm sorry, file by paper. Just let them know that processing may take a little longer. Let's look at the anchor benefit payments is especially we want to talk about what's new for 2020. So it's based on the 2020 New Jersey gross income because this is the 2020 anchor benefit. So if you look at this chart, so they're telling you, if you have your 2020 New Jersey 1040, you want to look at line 29. If, if, if your gross income is $150,000 or less, and you are 65 years or younger, you will receive $1,500. If you are 65 and older or were 65 or older in um, 2020, you'll receive $1,750. You'll see the next row, 150 and one, 150 and one, and 250,000, the year of 2020, if they were 64 or younger, it's $1,000. And if they were um, 65 and older, it's $1,250. And this is for homeowners. So keep in mind, they had to be 65 or older as of December 31st of 2020, because we are talking about the year of 2020. We're not talking about 2023. So if someone just turned 65 this year, then they will be considered 64 or younger. They won't get the $250 benefit, that additional benefit. For renters, the benefit amount is just a flat $450. If, if they're 64 or younger, and if they're 65 and older, they get that additional $250, which brings it to $700. But renter's income cannot exceed $150,000. So if it does, they're not eligible for the program. Just want to remind you that this is for the year of 2020. So an applicant would have to have been 65 or older as of December 31st, 2020 to receive the additional $250. So we have the new process for paying benefits. Eligible benefit confirmation letters recipients should receive payment prior to November the 1st of this year. So we have a weekly payment selection on a rolling basis. 
So this is different from last year. Last year, we sent out things by, um, we sent out mailers by county and we had like a schedule of when the payments would be going out, the benefit would be going out, but we're doing it on a rolling basis this year. So payments will be issued approximately 90 days from the date of filing the application. If you filed and you wanna check your benefit status, you can use our online inquiry system, but please allow up to 10 days from the filing date. If for some reason you need to file by mail, allow 60 days from the filing date to check your benefit status on the online inquiry system. If taxation needs to verify any information, the process may take a little longer. We have to outreach um, the applicant, wait for the information, look over the information, make sure everything is okay, and then process the payment. So it may take a little longer. I love this part. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes, I have a question. I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Um, Abra, or Abra, I don't know how she pronounced her name, Abra. previously said um, that she was going to send out a contact for if you want someone, either she or you, to speak at the library or community center. But I didn't see that in the chat room. So I, I put it in the chat, uh, just the link, because that link comes directly to Taxation University. So that comes directly to us. Um, if you want a specific speaker, you could always put our name in there. And if we're available, we can we will certainly do our darn our darndest <laughs> to attend that uh, to attend that event. But I, I put the link in there to go online to request a speaker. Did you see that? No, I did not. That's why I'm bringing it up. I didn't see the link to request this speaker. I saw the link like if you wanted the PDR, PTR 22 or 23, what link that was. But I didn't see the link to request a speaker. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll also put that in the email when we send you the recording. So I'll send that out to everybody who's registered. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have a question too. I have a question. Okay, let's do Irene and then Sivella. Irene first. Sivella. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I filed for Anchor last year and I got uh, a letter today, uh, not today, uh, this year that I don't need to do anything. So thank you for that. Uh, my son is eligible for Anchor program uh, this year. However, uh, he was renting an apartment with a girlfriend and uh, they are no longer together. Uh, how can, can he file for uh, Anchor? Yes, he can file for Anchor. Even if he was not claiming rent on his returns? Did he pay rent? Of course. So yes, he can file for the Anchor program. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then Savella? I don't know if yes. I'm saying that right. So I, I may have, yes, it's Savella. I may have missed this in the beginning of the presentation. Two questions. One, what is the purpose of this anchor program? If I missed it, I probably did. And also, is it only for 20, starting in 2020? No. So what the anchor program is, is a... So in 2018, I'll just go back to 2018. In 2018, we had the Homestead Benefit Program, but we didn't reach a lot of residents, if you will, because of the income. So the income kind of knocked a lot of people out. This has now, the new law has expanded the um, 
income eligibilities are a little bit higher. So now we're able to, the limit, if you will, now we're able to reach more applicants. So it changed, if you will, what the Homestead Benefit Program used to be. Now we're just beginning with the year of 2019. So what happened when they had the Homestead Benefit, there was a pause, if you will, in a few years of administering the homestead benefit due to the budget. But when they started it back up, instead of starting it back up at the year that the world was all in, they started it where they left off. So that's why we're behind, if you will. So last year was the first year of Anchor, but it was for 2019. This year is for 2020. And we don't know like if they'll ever catch up, but if they do, then homeowners and of course renters are going to miss out on some years of benefits. So, and the purpose of it is it is a property tax relief. That's what it is. So homestead benefit used to give people a credit on their property taxes and the applicants would just never see it really. But now with the anchor program, you can actually get that money in hand, if you will. So the renters, um, they get $450 before they couldn't get anything in the homestead benefit program. So this is one of the property tax relief programs that um, the state of New Jersey Division of Taxation administers, just like the senior freeze that April talked about in the beginning. And so one more thing. So based on that, so you would send this form out to the homeowner or the renter automatically. Um, and, and that means that if they're qualified age-wise based on their tax returns that you received for each, that year? So it's based on um, few, a few things. So if they filed last year and they received the benefit, we're going to send them information out. If our system sees that they are eligible, um, once they run a program, if they see that they're eligible, then they'll send it out. And we also, when um, our system does that, we also have access to um, other agencies, if you will, that give us the information about properties and things like that. So we're outreaching the population that we need to outreach um, as it relates to applications and getting the benefits to the applicants. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So what is the, um, uh, the, uh, the time frame of eligibility for ANCA? Could you say it again? I'm not sure what you mean, the eligibility um, that you had for to. Renters. Uh, when uh, uh, were you supposed to be a renter in order to qualify for? Uh, as of as of October the 1st of 2020. Twenty twenty until October the 1st, 2021? Nope, it, it just depends on where you were October the 1st of 2020, if you were renting or a homeowner. So just, just that day? Yep, that's the magic day, October the 1st of 2020. Okay, if you were renting, you're eligible for anchor. Yes. Okay, thank you. So if you were renting as of October the 1st, 2020, you can go online, provided that you meet the um, income um, eligibility, so you can't go over $150,000, then they can just go ahead on the website and file the application, make sure they get the confirmation number. Okay, and New Jersey gross uh, income is online? Uh, 29. 29. Yes, of your NJ 1040. So yes. that's your state tax return, not yes. your 1040. Your 1040 is federal. Yes, NJ 1040. That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, Monisha, we have a question that um, they have seniors who are still waiting for the paper checks from the last anchor rebate. Um, they want to know when they will receive them. Then also, is anchor paid by check or can it be direct deposit? I may have missed that if you said it. So anchor can be paid by check or direct deposit. And 
I can't really answer the other question. It's on a case by case basis. We don't okay. know why it's held up. So if you've been outreached for some additional documents, um, make sure you respond. There should be an address on. Um, if someone outreached you, make sure you respond so you can get the information so they can process your 2019 anchor. If you okay. call, I do want to apologize early on. Um, the call times are high because um, Anchor is up and running now. We're in the thick of Anchor right now. So um, I apologize. We know that the call times, call holds are, um, they're really high, but just be patient with us. The call center does a great job. Um, yeah. The hotline, they do a great job trying to answer questions and get to everyone. And the anchor application for renters uh, are available online at anchor.nj.gov. What I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. The anchor application for renters I, is available online. Yes, the paper applications are available online. However, the renters don't have to file paper. They can just go online and file. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think we have a quick question was, um, is the income limit 150 or 250,000? And I don't know if that it was for, if somebody's asking for senior freeze or for anchor. Jane Griffith, if you wanna unmute yourself to ask that. Can I just answer that one? Can I answer that one? Sure. Yes, please. Who you are, right? So if you're, it's 150,000 is the limit for anchor. If you're a homeowner, the income limit is 250,000. So it really depends. And if we're talking senior freeze, the income limit for the 2022 application is 99,000 and some change. I can't remember the number exactly. But if we're talking the 2023 application, it's going to be 150,000. So I hope that helps. Well, we, um... We covered a lot of information here, and I want to thank you very much. So I'm going to uh, close out the questions. I will send the recording as soon as it's processed. I'm going to send it to everybody who registered. Um, I will also send you the phone numbers and the website if you would like to reach out for more information or to invite a speaker to your community. But um, again, we really feel that the property tax relief is so important to our older residents and allowing them to age in place. And we really appreciate your time today. And all the time that you put into this every other day of the year, we know it's a lot of work, um, but it really makes a, a, a huge difference to so many of our retirees and we appreciate it. Hey, Kathy, before you close, can sure. I have one question that was in the chat? Somebody said, and I, it was too long for me to type, so I was kind of waiting to answer. <laughs> sure. So somebody asked the question, what's the difference between senior freeze and anchor? Anchor is open to all homeowners and renters in the state who meet the eligibility requirements and who occupied a property um, on as their principal residence on October 1. So that's open to everybody. You were a renter, you were a homeowner, you met the eligibility requirements, you live somewhere in New Jersey as your principal residence on October 1, you're eligible. The PTR, the senior freeze is geared strictly for senior citizens or disabled residents of our state who either owned property or who um, um, rented a mobile, um, owned a mobile home that in a mobile home park that's located in a mobile home park. So that's the difference. And the guidelines there for income are different. Um, the requirements are a lot different for that. So it's geared to for seniors, whereas anchor is for everybody. I guess that's the main difference. That's a great way to boil it down. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, both of you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you.